Good afternoon and most welcome to Heidegger 763. We will today talk about prana uh, and I also name the lecture prana the life force and I will try to segue us into thinking what prana could be. Uh, it's named, I checked a uh, uh, Sanskrit dictionary on the uh, net and it's one of those words that are most difficult to explain. Uh, as I mentioned last time, it doesn't seem to be any space for it in our language. Uh, and what I will try to do is to give some space for it, see if we can't sort of ease ourselves into it. And this is how it's spelled in Sanskrit. And one usually say that there are channels within the body called the nadis. And the nadis is the one that sort of relocates and relay uh, uh, the prana. The prana is almost like blood or air or something similar to that. And it goes for these different channels. I haven't put them all in, but they are rather complicated and they have connection to each other. But it's generally true, as I mentioned last time, it goes from the very ground upwards. And it's fueled by the difference uh, between the earth that is usually referred to as the moon, moon part of the reality, and the sky or the air or the sun. Sun is usually the reference. And therefore we have the name in yoga, for instance, ha ta yoga, and that means sun and moon. To conclusion. And the more the moon can be moon, and the more the sun can be sun, the more prana you have, the more distinct they are. So it's the actual distinctiveness that produce the prana. It's not something in between, and that's a common misconception, that hatha is some intermediate ground in between the sky and the earth. We actually much dependent on these things being very different. So, controlling of the prana is called pranayama. That is actually a discipline, and I think that could help to understand a little bit that prana can be first discovered. And you could say that you discovered it once and you yesterday. Uh, I learned about prana for the first time when I was in Mysore in southern India in the province of Karnataka. There was a teacher there that told me about prana. But as always, since I did not practice, I could not understand it. And I remember in the discussions we had later, we went for tea. Uh, I don't think any of us grasped what this prana was. And some just said it was energy of some sort. But there is no detected energy in this area, neither from biology or nor physics. So it seems to be something completely different. And as I said, it has to do with our proprioception. Our proprioception is our feed with the body, how we organize ourselves, how we are moving about. Let me show a little bit. When I move around like I do now, there is a guiding principle somewhere. Something guides me in this movement. And that guidance is prana. Sort of a going somewhere. 
And this is how I often come across it when I hear it in Japanese when I study that. Do you have a nice key? Do you have a good key? And that's usually a person that moves very intentionally, willingly. He goes where he wants to go. That is a very good clue. And here we will have an objection from a Westerner saying, don't we move as we want to? Well, it's complicated, but I would say in a sense, no. It has actually been proven from neuro neurology that we move in concert with the things that are around us. And that could be emphasized when you come to people that have some deficit in the cognitive function. Uh, one example I checked up was a nurse. She had a somewhat stroke in her cognitive directional feature. It wasn't much harm, it didn't affect her to any high degree. But what happened was an exaggeration of this lack of guidance or intention. Because intention and guidance are actually completely two. Uh, it's a separate function apart from the rest of uh, what the brain body system does. And how does this work? This, this work? Because this needs to be exemplified. Well, for instance, this nurse, uh, if you gave her uh, instruments to check the blood pressure and pulse, which that nurse has done millions of times maybe in her lifetime, she worked, uh, was when she had her accident somewhere in, in her late 50s. If you gave her the instruments and took up your arm like this, she checked your pulse. And we're now talking about the person who's completely sane. There's nothing wrong with her. She doesn't fail any intellectual tests. She doesn't suffer from dementia. Nothing of that. And we need to think that most of the things we do are actually together with the environment. And because she works with this checking blood pressure and pulse, it's natural for her when she sees somebody take up her arm like this to take the blood pressure. And although how weird that uh, sounds, we, we know now that there is another function and that is directional function or guidance function. And that function is something separate and it's not as good in everyone. It has different qualities in people. And most of us, to 80-90%, we just react with the environment. So if we put before something, we do that. If we got a blood pressure measure, uh, for instance, if I uh, am presented with something I work a lot with, I just start without any intention of so doing. So we are connected to the environment, and that makes sense. It's all what rhymes with we have always been in the world. The world cannot be a stranger to us. We're not walking around in the world doing things that we want. We are developed with the world. So this is this react directly to the environment. And this is actually how most of our education works. It trains us to react more or less directly. And then we have a really weak intentional structure that leads us. Prana is that structure. But since prana in our region, in our culture, is incredibly weak, uh, we don't notice prana. But it can be made conscious. There are people who went over from, uh, so to speak, Western thinking and not having an intention or guidance to go with guidance. And prana is much, much connected to guidance. Uh, and that goes from the bottom up. And we know also most of the 
movement energy comes from the bottom and it goes up. Uh, the best way to show that is actually with a tensegrity structure. That is easy to realize. And since I've got one, I will put one together and I will post this as an addendum to this YouTube video today here. Uh, but it suffers for now to remember that we actually start, we start from below and then we go upwards. People usually think that uh, we start somewhere midway or we move uh, just up somewhere. No, we need to be stable on the ground. The less contact we have with the ground, the less we can actually move willingly. So it almost is similar to the sitting bones, but it's more connected to the feet. And if you don't have contact with your feet or the feet doesn't have contact with the floor, you would be more or less like that nurse. You react to your environment. You will not have a guiding principle. And therefore, it's even harder to understand prana because you don't have much of it. It's a resource, so to speak. It's a little bit like uh, Norway has oil, our Swedes, four Swedes, we don't have oil. But it can, can both be discovered and it can also be developed. You can learn how to use prana to your benefit because it has incredible health benefits uh, and it's also in itself something incredibly amazing. I felt for instance this night waking up being surrounded by sheer lights from coming from all directions and I felt a sort of life livelihood I, I, I don't think I ever felt it was really weird. It was like life itself. So the name is actually quite befitting. It's the life force. To be alive is prana. And uh, that is of course very much connected to doing things that you really want. Not just reacting and doing it like the nurse, which is in 80-90% of the cases in Western culture. Uh, actually, in India is only 2-3%. The difference is huge. They have a free voluntary prana. And I think one good example is the Indian traffic. They don't respect any rules. They go in every direction. But for some mad reason, they don't crash. Imagine having a crowded street where people don't even obey driving on the left, which you're supposed to do in India. They don't. They go from all directions. And if you as a Westerner, Westerner enter into that environment, you will crash. It's, uh, it's extremely dangerous for us. But they seem to do it, and they do it with prana. And the interesting thing with prana, it's very much connected to what we mentioned the other day, constructing reality. You have an image of reality and you just think it and then it's done. Whereas in the West, first I have to gain a momentum, I have to decide what to do and then I forcefully do it. I have to do it. And it's also that having to do something or voluntarily. These two give very different activities in the body. They're very quite different. And voluntary, you get that for free. That's what you had when you were very small. You wanted to do different things. You walked about and then you lost it when you got older. Prana is regaining that force once more. And it's very much connection, connected to intention. And the more prana you have, the more intention you have. And the more you, it's possible for you to do whatever you want. You can construct your reality. So you see, it's connected to the light. And the light is almost the color that paints reality. If you feel that the light is coming from outside of you somehow, going to you, that is... The conception of having low prana 
But if you feel that you start the light somewhere, it starts within you and you use it to create what's around you. Uh, it's beaming from you to reality and what you want to see is what you see and you want your want is effortless it doesn't take any effort that's very important it just happens and that of course goes against the grain how we perceive ourselves in the west because for us everything is very heavy even to get out of the chair it takes a lot of strain i saw so many times in india that were imitating westerners getting out of the chair or just lying down it takes a lot of effort for us and this is the lack of prana or uh, the guidance or whatever you call it or the effect coming from the feet that you are firmly grounded and one good example is of course tadasana that's why tadasana is such an important practice and Iyengar said he had never in his life met one westerner who actually could accomplish Tadasana. So he never taught anyone Tadasana until they were very high, and those were all Indian, Burmese, or Thai. And that's an important thing. We need first to understand that our, well, you can actually borrow from the other lecture, our metaphysical inclination makes it impossible for us to enforce prana. So this is the first we need to do. And then we need to practice it. We need to see prana. And by seeing prana, you have prana. But the thing is, you have to look from it, as we say in Sweden, to lure it or to procure it or conjure it, I would say. Conjure it. I think that's the nice word. Either conjure Think about it as conjure, like a conjurist or a witch or something. You conjure it, you make it, you make your prana. Uh, and this goes parallel to the idea in quantum physics that like you construct your reality. And some people uh, are not very good to see that they are constructing reality because we're all doing that. So they see it after it's happened. They think there is something happening outside of them. There is a cause effect thing and everything is finished and the only thing they can do is be uh, sort of passive onlookers. Uh, that's called in quantum physics uh, the bystander illusion. That reality happens by itself and everything in Western culture is directed to uh, sort of uh, reinforce that or give that illusion. That makes it incredibly strong. Uh, I can give an example from the East. I think those examples could be good in the beginning. A little bit like anecdotes, uh, like a bit of candy you could take home. Uh, you can digest it. It's not very healthy. It's not maybe not that good for understanding, but it's still something sweet in the beginning. It could, yeah, it's better. It's more like an inclination, a reward. Later, it's going to get tougher. You, you need to strain yourself a little more. But these little candies are very good. One thing I noticed in, for instance, Japan, and that's also the case in Korea and China, is if, uh, if you visit the uh, primary school, uh, it's very, very different from our schools. But one thing is very different is that they all bring their own food. And sometimes they even have prepared it themselves if they're a bit older. But all the kids bring their own food. And that's not because they are very cheap with the school food in Japan. That's because they need to learn that reality is something good, something that is helpful for you too. You're not a bystander. World is actually yours. It's your reality. And another thing is they clean their own school soul hall. Everyone does that. They clean themselves in the morning, they prepare everything. And the reason for that is they're not bystanders. Actually, it's considered extremely cruel not to let the kids clean their own things. For us, it's just boring. It's a horrible task. And I think when I was in school, I would never have done, liked to do that. The reason is 
I learned from the very beginning as a child that I'm not part of reality. I'm just a bystander. I can't affect things. And there's extreme uh, cruelty. Uh, they call it chikusho, those people who train kids not to clean up. It's very cruel. It's like hitting a kid very, very hard and decisive. Uh, an act of cruelty. Because that's going to teach the kid that's an older bystander. And to be a bystander, if they could even understand the horrors of being that, is the Japanese jigoku. Their hell, uh, jigoku's hell, their hell is being a bystander. It doesn't contain heat, it doesn't contain too much water, it actually had loads of food, their hell. Uh, and they have everything they want. But the thing is, they can only look at it. They cannot participate, and that is hell. And for their constructed hell is actually our living reality. Something that James Clavell pointed out uh, already in the 60s. It's a very interesting observation. They are never bystanders. And bystander makes you not understanding your prana or have any prana. And bystander is a little bit connected to distance also and uh, for hunger. It's not exactly the same, but it's in that ballpark, so to speak. It's somewhere in that region. Uh, I can do like a map and I can say bystander is somewhere here and 400 is here. It's, it's in the same ballpark, somewhere there. Just maybe bystander in some ways is more extreme, in some other ways is quite normal, here at least. Uh, and all the words, the verbs, uh, it's a very verb-inclined language, uh, languages you find there. Everything is connected to action. Everything is action. An object is an active ingredient in their lives. And they also have prana. So that's another interesting little gem you can take home. Even the inanimate objects have prana. And now you understand their big cut between I'm on the inside, that's on the outside, but also the cut between spiritual or uh, mind and matter is not that like big cut. It's more like a progression. And uh, no, also uh, inanimate objects do have prana, less prana though, less. But they do have it, because they participate in the happening, in presencing, as Heidegger would, would call it. There. So it's a different way of being. And of course, a person like Roger Federer, he has prana. People who are active in the West also have it. Uh, maybe he won't be able to sort of verbally produce an introduction to it. Maybe he's not even that conscious about it, but he has it. He's, cons he's act actively constructing his own reality, which we all are, but he knows it somehow, and he does it in his own direction, like he wants it. He knows he's going to win the game the moment he steps into, uh, into, into the tennis field. He's already finished there somehow. And uh, I, I can recognize that thing. I've felt it a few times, and it's a beautiful feeling. You know everything's going to go your way already at the start. And that's when you're constructing reality. That's the only way to go about. Uh, as to cite Jürgen Barber, you can't wait for the reality to happen. You have to do it yourself. Otherwise, you are living in the past of your own actions. And that is very interesting. We are at the center of what's happening all the time. So. It's like we are nowhere to be found in reality, uh, whereas they are situated here in, in this space, and they're all standing in a really odd way. And I realized that much later, that's the balanced state of standing. That's standing completely tall, almost like this I'm standing on. You are erected and you, you can lick some you can sort of look about the world much higher up. 
and all of a sudden you feel you have a choice and the energy is coming for you in a beautiful way and I'd say it's going out of top of the head because that's the position of the highest chakra, the head chakra. It takes that circumstance out and it goes around you and it comes from you originally, it's a light. And that also goes to show weird expressions that come upon. They seldom say that the lamp shines up somewhere, but they say the light is coming from the people in the room or from, from the furniture in some instances. There is light coming and this light lights everything in a very pervasive, very mm, seductive way almost. It's warm, it's nice and uh, you feel energized. I don't want to use the word energy, but it's very hard to, but it's you feel energized and you feel your whole thinking system. Because here it's a much more connecting between thinking and another thing is very much connected to proprioception, the inner feel of your system. Something that we are one-fifth as good as the Easterners is a big difference there. They feel themselves from inwards. They feel um, how they are doing, where they are going. They usually move about really, really well, even if they're not able to see. And this is one of the tricks. My second, so to speak, uh, discovery uh, four or five days ago, uh, which I didn't have time to take up. And this is how we guide us in the West. We use our eyes to walk. And for us, it's very difficult to walk with our eyes shut. We get like nervous. But even if I don't, I'm not nervous, I get anxious and that in impedes my movement very hard. It, it's not normal to use your eyes as a guidance for you to move. Your eyes is more of a register of the reality. It's not, they're not here to guide your movements. You record the world and then you imagine something in your head and then you don't look anymore. Theodore does never look, a child never look, Easterners don't look, they construct the world first and then they look. It should be done in that order. And here's a thing I've been trying out. I've been trying out to see if I, this is not my invention, I read about it, to try and out to see if I can help my proprioception by not using my eyes when I move about. And I did not start by walking, I started by things I did with my hands. I could sit down and see if I could uh, do my morning ritual uh, that I uh, ritualized uh, when we had James Clear in Sjöderstad uh, six months ago, something like that. So I have my seven or eight gadgets here. And um, they were very hard in the beginning, but once I realized I have to put everything in a specific order and do them one by one, I managed to do that by my eyes shut. And here comes the interesting thing. As soon as my proprioception got back better, I, I started feeling the floor. I started feeling how I sat all of a sudden. Although I have a train sitting well as much, I usually move about. But all of a sudden I start feeling how I sat in my sitting bone. And even on the bed, which is really soft, which is really very hard for me before to feel my sitting. I felt them and I sat like I was sitting on a throne and I could really feel the closeness to the ground and all of a sudden I felt this pile of energy coming up on me it just lasted a second and I think that's the start of awakening of the system almost like you turn the car key uh, and the engine sort of coughs and you know that's the first start of the, uh, the whole thing and then it will start properly. The first is a cough, like a <laughs> and then it comes, like rounds the cylinders and everything is on, on its way. So by propsing proprioception, something we're really bad with in the West, they are incredibly good, or in the East, everything is connected to proprioception there. 
we don't even have any words for them. Proprioception is a scientific word. Most people don't know about them. They have like 30, 40, 50 words for different things to do with proprioception. And often there is some connection with prana. So they have prana and then they have a verb or they have prana and they have an adjective, something like that, to show the difference in the inner side. Uh, when prana is strong, when it's medium strong, when it's red, red means something actually very special. It doesn't mean that you're angry. Uh, as I thought, red prana is something specific. Uh, actually, it could be a stronger variety of prana in some instances. It shows a really good aptitude to act. And that's another thing, our lack of acting. We are usually very small, slow when it comes to acting, quick in the West. Our thinking is uh, at best meandering. It goes in all sorts of directions. A uh, little bit like the educational system that wants us to gather or bits of information, put them together and then you analyze them and then you make action from them. That's way too complicated. Everything is going to be lost. The kingdom is going to be lost by then. You have nothing in there. You stand there with empty hands and all the opportunities has sort of left your hands. Uh, you won't catch a bird. You won't be a good hunter. Whereas you notice uh, quick, when proprioception quicks, uh, keeps in, your thinking becomes stronger, more quick, quicker, not as uh, meandering, slow, uh, you sometimes feel like thinking is like walking uh, in syrup or being dragged down, walking on a muddy field and you feel your thoughts getting stuck in the mud somewhere. A uh, little bit, this is almost like N2, yeah, these neurons that are very, very slow and take a lot of energy, but oddly enough, starts very quick and burn their energy. But what happens with these neurons, they fire in, in all the other direction at the same time. So they are a bit like a cluster bomb, but cluster bombs is not what our mind needs. It needs a clear directed way because with a clear directed way you can make action and you can start, as I mentioned earlier, construct your own reality. But I'd say these things are very much connected as some sort of guidance, uh, planning that your the world doesn't happen to you, the world is something you make, and the third being that you are absolutely active in everything. Your thinking, your bodily movements. You do not move like you are one of these dolls with uh, strings. An often very used metaphor for Westerners that they are like, I don't know what they call it in English, but we call them sprattelogga in Swedish. Uh, it's like, they move from some outward force, some force is outside on the self. Probably panopticon or something like that. Well, I think I have to round out there. It was really pleasurable talking about Prana again. And I wish you a pleasant afternoon. Until next time, bye bye. Thank you.